Namaste World Razor, Sabina and Roger here. Mm. Let's learn about Patanjali. We got so many signs lately about Patanjali, not just our comment section. We were in the charity shop and mm. uh, we came across this and then it was mentioned here and there. And it's like, we gotta learn, I gotta learn who is Patanjali and what is yoga. Roger, mm -hmm. any idea about Patanjali? Yeah, I actually, yeah. I actually read what? the Yoga Sutras. Yeah, in Nepal, remember in between the two courses, between the October course and the November course, yeah. I went for a three-week yoga retreat. Yeah, and then they had the book there, so I read it. It was a smaller version than this one, okay. I believe, but there was a Ooh. lot of information in there. I don't know if I was ready at that time for it. It was oh, very, okay. yeah, confusing, very high, deep teachings mind-boggling all about yoga the chakras everything material nature and all of it so it's very intricate this is probably gonna <laughs> explain it please explain it in easier <laughs> language if roger already doesn't understand something that means like i have no chance yeah well back but then. i do trust project shiboham oh yeah so thank you for this video What are they chanting? Before even getting to what is yoga, we need to first know about who gave yoga, the one which we are using today. It is Patanjali. So let's see the story of Patanjali in first place. In the next, what exactly is yoga in very simple words? It is a very complex subject, but we tried our best to bring forward it in the most simplistic manner. So in this chapter, we'll see what it is. And the third chapter is about Kundalini Yoga, one of the highest mm -hmm. forms of yoga, which is very complex. But the reason we brought that also into this documentary is there are a lot of misconceptions around Kundalini Yoga. So we want to mm -hmm. do our bit in clearing out those misconceptions to the best of our abilities. Now let's see these three cool. chapters in this documentary. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Starting with the first chapter, the story of Patanjali. As per Shiva Mahapuranam and couple of other scriptures, one day Lord Shiva was in a deep hmm. state of ecstasy in the form of Nataraja in performing a special type of cosmic dance called hmm. Ajapatandava. While this event is happening, Bhagavan Sri Mahavishnu goes into a deep state of meditation and experiences the cosmic dance of Shiva. Very hmm. much interested in this course of events, Adi Sesha, who is the Vahanam of Sri Mahavishnu, requests him he also would like to experience the ecstatic dance of Nataraja. That's when Bhagavan Sri Mahavishnu orders Adi Sesha to go to Chidambaram, a place which is the abode of Mahadev in the form of Nataraja. And that's where you can get to experience the celestial event of Shivatandava. In simple hmm. words, Sri Mahavishnu hmm. orders Adi Sesha to go to Chidambaram and serve Nataraja. Wow, cool. One day, a woman named Gonika was praying to Surya Bhagavan for her wish of bearing a child. And as she held her hands in a praying pose, which is called as Anjali, both palms joined facing above the sky. A small baby snake fell from the skies into her hands. Aww. And that baby snake is no one but Adi Sesha himself. As hmm. he fell down from the oh. skies into her hands, the downfall in Sanskritam is called as Patana. And the folded hands is called as Anjali as he fell into the folded hands from the skies. Patan plus Anjali, Patanjali became his name. And he hmm. took up an incarnation of a humanoid snake. Oh, oh dear. Wow. So after taking up that incarnation of Adi Sesha as Patanjali, in a place called Chidambaram in today's Tamil Nadu, where Mahadev is worshipped as Nataraja, that's where Patanjali served Nataraja. The worship of Nagas has been deeply into the culture of India since times immemorial. And Patanjali being Adi Sesha, is highly revered and worshipped, even today. Hmm. And wherever Mahadev is shown as Nataraja, he has two attendants with him. One is Patanjali, whom we just discussed about, and the other one is Vyagrapada, a humanoid with half tiger and half man. If one really have to experience hmm. Patanjali, is mostly found in Tamil culture. Mm -hmm. Across India, one of the greatest cultures that has incredibly long history and heritage is Tamil culture, and that's where we have 18 Siddhars or Yogis who shaped up this great culture and Patanjali is one of them. As you see in the pictures mm. here or in the carvings shown with the markings, Patanjali is always shown accompanying Nataraja in his dance. Oh. That's what he wished for as Adi Sesha. Ah. 
Cool. Mm. And now let's get to the point about why we are talking about Patanjali. He's the one who wrote three incredibly powerful scriptures which helped humanity from three most important quarters of life. Now let's see what they are. The first one is Ayurveda. Patanjali wrote a scripture on Ayurveda which is called as Patanjali Tantra which in turn of course ascribes to Sushruta Samhita. But Patanjali Tantra is specialized in various kinds of treatments for different kinds of ailments what a human can come across. It is one of the primordial sources of Ayurveda. The second one is Mahabhashya. Patanjali gave a detailed commentary for Panini's Ashtadhyayi. We have done a couple of documentaries on Sanskritam already on this channel and like I already said, the maturity of a language shows the maturity of a civilization. And if one can understand how matured Sanskritam as a language, one will be able to appreciate how advanced the civilization was back then. When I'm saying advanced, it's not about outlandish claims of Vimanas or something like that. It's about the clarity people had back then about life, spirituality, mathematics, science, biology, philosophy, and a lot more. Hmm. Nice. Good. The third one, the last and the most important reason why we are talking about Patanjali is he is the one who gave Patanjali Yoga Sutras. The foundation for the yoga what we know today was given by Patanjali. Now yoga is not about stretching legs and hands on a mat. It is a lot <laughs> deeper and a vast majority oh, of yeah. the people across the globe who are practicing yoga do not know where it came from. It came from Patanjali and we'll see that in more detail in this documentary going forward. And a quick roll up of the three, Patanjali gave Patanjali Tantra for physical health, that's Ayurveda, and Yoga Sutras for spiritual health, mm. and Mahabhashyam for social health, that is through communication with a better language and grammar. There are many scriptures given by rishis or yogis and in Indian scriptures, but Patanjali stands out for one simple reason. He covered three most important quarters of anybody's life, the physical, the mental, and the social health, all three mm. contributing to a better quality of life. Nice. Mm -hmm. Now if you take a quick look back, yoga that started as a conversation between Bhagavan Sri Mahavishnu and Mahadev. Patanjali learned it from both Vishnu and Shiva and he gave three different scriptures on yoga, Ayurveda and Mahabhashya and was passed down eventually to his student Adi Shankaracharya. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. is Patanjali that... is in the Guru's mm -hmm. lineage of Adi Shankaracharya and Adi Shankaracharya has set up four pitas. Dwaraka, Badari, Sringeri and Puri where his legacy is still being continued. Puri. So the knowledge that was passed oh. down by Bhagavan Sri Mahavishnu and Bhagavan Shiva to Patanjali and from Patanjali to Adi Shankaracharya and from Adi Shankaracharya to four pithas across India running the great legacy of Patanjali. And that in short is the story of Patanjali. Pause here. Um, hmm. Okay, can you explain that to me again in your words? Yeah, so it's very fascinating. So basically, so he is Shisha Nag. So basically the the Naga who, you know, Vishnu is residing on in the cosmic yeah. ocean, which is also, you know, Balram incarnates, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, so basically yeah. Patanjali, that's what it's saying. So Patanjali is Naga. the same Naga incarnation, right? So okay, which means me so Lakshman, me... okay. Balram, and then Patanjali. Patanjali. Oh. So let me know if I got that correct. So basically, and it's a con conversation or the intermingling of Vishnu and Mahadev, so Shiva, right? And then yeah. he's, uh, you know, descending from that. But uh, what does Shiva have to do with it? He was dancing the cosmic dance and then Sh Vishnu was... Yeah, Vishnu was aware of it and wis witnessing yeah. it and then, you know, Sishanag, the serpent, wanted to go experience it too. So oh, I think yeah, they're, yeah. so I think they're getting into, <laughs> so you know, funny. the cosmic dance, and then wanting to, to be there in consciousness oh. to experience it because oh. it's quite the, quite the event. I want to experience. <laughs> Have you experienced Shiva's dance? So that's some pretty mm. profound up there, teachings. If anybody knows, wow. know more about it, let us know because okay. yeah, that was incredible. So then. Mm -hmm. So then coming from that line, and then Adi Shankaracharya is actually one of his students. I actually didn't know that, so that's fascinating too. And is he the Advaita yeah. Vedanta? Okay. Yeah, so he's okay. the big teacher of that. And then setting okay. up those schools and those 
four locations. Okay, and Dwarka, so we know now, because we just yeah. watched Kartikeya too, and there was the city of Dwarka, and we thought Dwarka is underwater, and we were confused, but it is a yeah, place. Yeah, it seems like okay. it's it's a place, and I don't know yet. Nobody has commented and let me know exactly what's happening with Dwarka, if it's just a community that was close to the sea where it sank, or mm -hmm. did just part of Dwarka sink. So. But anyways, talking about the the sacred texts that Patanjali compiled, right? So I wasn't aware of those as well, right? I was no, I knew of the Yoga Sutras, but the other two I didn't know about. So that's very cool. So he's actually like mm -hmm. one of the founding of, like Ayurveda is very popular in the world right now as holistic healing, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And cool. then also the text on the social benefits and stuff, right? Of yoga. So chapter two, I'm just looking at the picture. Is that Krishna with Arjun and the four white horses? Yeah. Okay, so Pant Patanjali, where yeah. is he in the timeline? Yeah, the timeline. Of Krishna so. and Rama. Yeah, I think it's fairly I think it's more recent times. If he was the more recent. Oh. Now let's see what is yoga in simple words. Yeah. While there are many scriptures defining what is yoga, the most simplistic one, which mm -hmm. each and every one of us can understand, comes from mm -hmm. Bhagavad Gita. And these yeah. are the words of Lord Krishna explaining Arjuna about what is yoga. Mm -hmm. Yogastha kuru karmani sangam tyaktva dhananjaya siddha siddhyo samo bhutva samatvam yoga uchyate. That translates to be steadfast in the performance of your duty and treat both success and failure equally and such mm. state of mind is called as yoga. Sounds very simple, but incredibly complex mm -hmm. to practice in real life. Can we really be so indifferent to success and failure? It's easier mm. said than done, but that oh, is yeah. what yoga is. Love it. Now that you understood the most simplistic definition about yoga, now let's get to one of the most complex definitions of yoga as well. And this is what Patanjali defines yoga as. Yoga chitta vrutti nirodha. Sounds so simple, but the meaning is so deep. Yoga is a process of restraining chitta from any fluctuations. Nice. A very loose Boom. translation of this word chitta is mind, but it is mm. actually not mind, it's a state of mind. And we'll see in a minute what it is. Mm. Nice. Let's step out a bit towards the human anatomy. The structure of the brain, as we know, is scientifically classified into four different parts, rather five. So there are four lobes which is called as cerebrum and one lobe called as cerebellum. And these four lobes together are frontal lobe, which is responsible for personality, characteristics, decision-making, movement, and actions like that. And the parietal lobe mm. is more about identifying the objects, interpreting pain, touch in the body. So these are the functions of this part of the brain. Occipital lobe, it controls the vision and the color perception about your abilities on recognizing the colors. All those are stored in this part of the brain. And the fourth one is temporal lobe, which is mostly the reservoir for short-term memory, hearing, speech, perception of musical rhythm, etc. And the fifth part is cerebellum, which is to coordinate voluntary muscle movements to maintain the posture, balance of the body, etc. So this is the construct of human brain as we know today. And depending on which state of mind you are, different parts of brain gets activated and the actions are directed accordingly. Now, if we try to understand the same human brain as per Yoga Siddhantam, the anatomy is classified in a different format. Towards the left, what we just saw, the lobes with different functions, the physical classification of the tangible parts of brain, that's how the anatomy is classified. While in Yoga Siddhantam, the human brain is classified into four levels, four levels of consciousness, or in simple words, four different states of mind. So the state of mind defines how the brain behaves. So the first level is manas, and the second level is ahankara or ahankaram, and the third level is buddhi, and the final level is chitta. These are the four levels in which a human brain could oscillate. And on a lighter note, you should not be comparing these two because the purpose is totally different. The scientific classification mm. is more towards understanding the physical properties of a brain, while Yoga Siddhantam focuses on a holistic approach about how your brain would function in different states of mind. So they are mm. not contesting, but complementing each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is quite important to understand these four levels of brain as per Yoga Siddhantam. So let's briefly see them, starting with the first one, Manas. Manas is a state of mind where the sensory perception of pleasure and pain takes the center stage. And in any of your decision makings, 
such kind of a pleasure would be the deciding factor whether you would like to opt for something or not. It depends on the pleasure or pain you derive from doing that specific thing. You take the call whether you want to do it or not. And that is the state of mind called manas. And the second one is ahankaram. Here, it's an egocentric attitude in decision making. So if I take a call in a self-centric approach, it's like I, me, myself. If I take a call in that note, then it is in the state of mind called ahankara. And the third state of mind is called as buddhi, where the decisions are made in a more rational approach, ability to discriminate what is good, what is not, and then take a call. Then that state of mind is called as buddhi. And the final and the topmost level of consciousness or your state of mind is called as chitta, which is the highest level where there is no difference between pleasure or pain. And honestly, this state of mind is very difficult to put in words. Apparently, they say that it is the highest level of consciousness or in simple words, the most stable state of mind where you will not be affected by any reason whatsoever and you are in full control your thoughts emotions feelings mm. everything is in full control of yourself and you will not be distracted by any other means and that rock steady state of mind is called as chitta and if we reflect mm. the definition of patanjali what he's saying is restraining chitta from any kind of fluctuations that means how can you hold yourself in such kind of a rock steady state of mind where there is no space for neither pleasure nor pain holding your mm. brain in that state is called as yoga like i said it's a complex mm. definition so yoga is a practice cool. where you raise your state of mind from manas to chitta and once a person realizes the chitta state of mind then there is no difference between god and man if a person is in the state of mind of manas is called as pashu and his journey all along these four levels of brain reaching out to the highest level is called as the journey towards pashupati a more mystical mm -hmm. definition about yoga is wow. a pashu becoming pashupati is called as yoga pashu oh, refers to anybody who is in the state of mind of manas and pashupati is anybody who is in the state of mind of chitta and yeah, this is too. also the reason why there mm. has been a saying of aham brahmasmi which means i myself is the god it's mm. just that i have to realize it getting into the state of chitta. So that's, that's a more of a mystical key. definition, but that's what mm. it is. And this is cool. also the reason why in Hinduism, it is said that you are responsible for your life, good or bad. Mm -hmm. Further down, Patanjali explains about a process in which you can attain the highest level of chitta. And he says that it is an eight step approach. Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana and Samadhi. These mm -hmm. eight are considered as the eight limbs of yoga or eight steps towards the highest level of consciousness of human mind. And this mm -hmm. is called as Ashtanga Yoga. Let's briefly see the eight what they are. Starting with the first one, Yama, it means having external discipline mm -hmm. and it is fivefold being non-violent, truthfulness, not stealing, and not wasting energy, and not being greedy. So this is the mm. very first step in yoga that one has to practice. Strictly follow these five guidelines. And the second step is Niyama, which means to have internal discipline, and is again fivefold. Bodily purification, contentment, spiritual observance, self-study, and devotion. These are the five important traits one has to develop to get into the second phase of Ashtanga Yoga, which is Niyama. Hmm. And the third phase is Asana. Asana is a posture which you can hold it comfortably and concentrate for a very long time. Now, this hmm. is the step which is widely popular across the world, which are the Yoga Asanas. And as an offshoot from Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, eventually Hatha Yoga, a special branch of yoga, got developed and which has 84 different asanas, which is in practice across the world today. But the foundation of it is given by Patanjali about how mm. an asana needs to be conducted. The main objective of asana is to sit comfortably for a long time in that posture and concentrate deeply on the entity that you would like to meditate. That we'll mm. see in a short while. And the fourth step of Ashtanga Yoga is Pranayama. This is also reasonably known across the world. Controlling the motion of exhalation and inhalation flows is called pranayama. 
And one very important point here with respect to pranayama is, it sounds to be so simple and easy task, but it is a very, very complex process. And I'll hold that for a minute because we're going to see something related to pranayama in a short while. Hmm. Up next and the fifth step of Ashtanga Yoga is Pratyahara. It is a process of withdrawing the senses from their abilities. From this step onwards, it goes into a metaphysical nature. That's what it is. In this step of yoga, it's all about withdrawing the sensory abilities of the sense organs voluntarily. Mm -hmm. The sixth step is dharana. Dharana is holding the mind onto a particular object of your focus. It it could be an entity or an object or a murti of a god, anything Mm -hmm. that you would like to concentrate and meditate upon. Remember that the choice of the entity is also very crucial. So for instance, if I am a devotee of Shiva, I could be meditating on uh, Shiva Mm Lingam. And the seventh stage is called Dhyana. Dhyana is a state of meditation. An unbroken flow of knowledge from that object of meditation is called as Dhyana. At this point, the person who is meditating will think of nothing else except the entity about which he or she mm. is meditating. Mm. Say for instance, if I'm meditating on a Shiva Lingam, I think of nothing else but fully just about that Shiva Lingam. And that state is Dhyana. And this state is very powerful because this state of Dhyana is the foundation for Buddhism, which originated eventually from Hinduism. And it mm. is called as Zen as it went eastward. Mm. Dhyana mm. became Zen. The eighth stage of Ashtanga Yoga is Samadhi. A final Mm. thoughtless state of mind is called as Samadhi. At this stage, a person will realize his or her highest state of mind, which is Chitta. It is difficult to verbally articulate what the stage is. But they say that Mm. this is the stage where one can realize Aham Brahmasmi. That I myself Mm. is the God. No. (laughs) Oh, damn. Hmm. I love it. I love it a lot. Yeah, that's very deep, right? So breaking it all down, right? We're basically a Pashu, and then we're (laughs) trying to become a Pashu Pati. So cute. (laughs) Yeah, along the eight steps. Mm -hmm. And then, so I love the description of that and how they all lead to the next one, right? So Yama is very much external. So we got to discipline our minds in relation to external behaviors, right? So nonviolence, truthfulness, not stealing, not wasting energy, not being greedy. So being a, basically a moral, mm-hmm. ethical person. And then once you become more spiritual and then you realize, you know, the true nature of reality and oneness and that we're one family, then these become, you know, automatic, right? It's not about imposing rules and guidelines. It's just like, if you want to be spiritual and you want to realize the truth of who you truly are, then you still need to start behaving appropriately. So that's basically step number one, right? Yeah, one second, please. I find it interesting, not wasting uh, energy. Because mm. these also remind me of the five uh, lay precepts, the call it in Buddhism. Mm. Okay. You know, uh, yeah. no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, uh, no intoxicants, um, and no lying. Mm-hmm. So we have also non-violence here with truthfulness, which is not lying mm-hmm. um not stealing is the same not being greedy could oh no no uh, they don't have no intoxicants no sexual misconduct yeah yeah oh maybe it's sexual miscon- like not wasting energy in that sense maybe also too you know? yeah and in general yeah if anybody knows want to give some examples of what it means to not waste energy yeah <laughs> Yeah, maybe it's just be productive with your energy and use your energy appropriately to like spiritual practices and learning yoga and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're not wasting energy and not wasting time Time. as well, right? Perhaps. Mm -hmm. So yeah, very cool. And then the next one, Niyama, right? So bodily purification. So this one is going more internally. So... So the step one is focusing on your external behavior in the world and making sure it's more pure. And then internal discipline, right? Mm -hmm. Purification, contentment, spiritual observance, self-study and devotion, right? So very much in line with, yeah, what Krishna is teaching in the Bhagavad Gita, Mm -hmm. right? So eventually leading to this bhakti and devotion, you know, to the truth and then studying who we are and getting to the root of that. Yeah, and then practicing spirituality right Mm -hmm. 
So. What do you think about as bodily purification, like the food you eat? Yeah, I think very much so. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this might be part of what you were saying. No intoxicants and stuff like that. Oh, ah, okay, okay. So it's in there, just on the next step, more of because yeah. it's an internal. Mm-hmm, cool. Thing. And Contentment, then, I totally get that. Spiritual observance, what does that mean? Like doing um, yeah, doing practices? The pujas, okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, sadhanas, all of that, right? So yeah. Study and devotion. Beautiful. And then, of course, we got, uh, yeah, the asanas. We all know about that. You know, the postures. And then that, he's right. It's totally popular all over the world, in the West, right? Mm -hmm. And many people think that that's what yoga is and they don't dive into the higher teachings of yoga, right? So, but it's very important, you know, and hopefully, you know, modern yogis and people practicing yoga asanas, you know, get into the depth and the higher teachings surrounding that. So then mm -hmm. they can go for the samadhi eventually. So then pranayama, right? Controlling the motion of the breath. And yeah, and there's different practices in regards to that. So it's important to, yeah, get in touch or follow a reputable teacher in order to get these teachings, right? Mm -hmm. So, because, yeah, it's not enough to just think you can do it alone. We do need a little bit of guidance <laughs> here, right? Yeah. Um, and even so, I see, you know, Wim Hof with his breathing oh. techniques, right? Mm -hmm. So I see him as a pranayama teacher, right? So he's all about that, so... And I, when we've done a lot of Wim Hof breathing, right? And then you, you focus on the mind. It gets really calm and stable, right? And then meditation is very, very easy after that. Ideally. Yeah. Well, <laughs> for me, Pratyahara. The withdrawal of the organs is by their giving up their own objects and taking the form of the mind stuff. So I think this is getting into the state of just being, you know, the conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. You know, and then tapping into that so that even though the senses are very much focused externally on their objects, uh, you're withdrawing, you know, the field of consciousness from those objects to either the senses themselves or beyond that to the consciousness that's aware of the senses, mm -hmm. right? Dharana. So then this is holding on to the mind to a particular object of your focus. So then you're, so you withdraw you know, the consciousness from the senses, and then this time instead you're focusing the consciousness, right? So and I think that's why Pratyahara is just before that, because in order to do, mm. you know, this one properly, you need to have a sense of what this consciousness is and this awareness, you know, or mindfulness. Because if you don't have a feel for that, then it's going to be very, very difficult to maintain the focus on a single object, right? Mm -hmm. So I love that he was talking about you know, any object will do. The very famous one is like holding on to a candle flame and observing that for a long time. But I loved how he chose, you know, a deity, a murti, right? Mm -hmm. And then just being very focused. So very powerful, right? And all helps to settle the mind, right? It's all about control of the mind. And then uh, jhana, right? So yeah, this word is like, you know, oftentimes synonymous with meditation itself, right? So just an unbroken flow. You're in a state, right? So it's unbroken with the object of meditation, right? It can be an external object or an internal object, such mm -hmm. as consciousness and awareness itself, right? And then when you get into that, then, yeah, then that leads to samadhi, which is the culmination, final thoughtless state, right? So this is, yeah, total flow state. That's where the bliss comes in. It's abiding, isn't it? That's yeah, like... just the thoughtless state of like pure, you know, consciousness. So I see it as, you know, awareness of awareness, right? So you're up there and then you're just pure beingness, right? There's no mind fluctuations in the sense of, you know, thought forms disturbing your mind. Even if they did come up in that state, they would just self-release, right? They okay. would be gone because you wouldn't be identified with them. Mm -hmm. So what's really feeding the thoughts all the time is when you're caught up and then you think that mm -hmm. you're the thinker and then that very mechanism of thinking that you're the thinker and being that is going to propel more thoughts to just come endlessly. But once you realize that you're not, and especially in this state, then it'll be just a continuous, ongoing, you know, awareness 
So you're beyond the mind? Have you transcended the mind completely or? Well, it depends on the definition of mind. You'd be mm. beyond the little ego psychological mind, right? So if you see that it has a bubble, right? And it's what he said with those little circle depictions. Should we go back to that one? When you're in the samadhi, you're at the chitta, right? Highest level of consciousness. So that it's aware of everything happening, you know, within the other spheres there, but it's, you know, beyond them. It, so you can see the ego as being, you know, the first two spheres, mm -hmm. right? Egocentric attitude, right? And it's not to say that, that that's not still within the complex, but you know, you're beyond it. You've, yeah, you've transcended that in that state. And I think you can be in the state of samadhi without, Having you know, becoming it. enlightened, right? It's just a very high state mm -hmm. that you'll come down from. But if you maintain it enough, then it'll lead to the higher, you know, different levels of samadhi and then eventually, yeah, full Poof. born enlightenment, <laughs> right? <laughs> no yeah. more mind. So just talking about the levels of consciousness um, in regards to David Hawkins. So manas and ahamkaram would be two, under 200? Yeah, in that sense, right? But they're also in, intermingled, right? With some higher levels because you could be an ego... But but buddhi isn't buddhi wouldn't buddhi be below uh, above two hundred to five hundred? Yeah, totally. And then chitta is everything beyond. Yeah, we could say beyond, yeah. like five hundred and above. Yeah. So bodhi chitta. Yeah, I know. I thought of <laughs> yeah. the awakened mind. Thanks so much for joining us for part number one. We're breaking this into two parts. And remember, the whole purpose why we're learning about these yoga sutras is to raise ourselves. And raise the world. Hmm. Thank you so much, everyone. See you on part number two.